Really great to meet you all. My name is David J. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am uh, joining us here from uh, unceded Ohlone territory, which is in Oakland, California. And I'm the chief mobilization officer at the Center for Humane Technology, um, which is a nonprofit that uh, has been working for about the past five years before that we were known as time well spent on the issues that bring us together today on the way that the attention economy is undermining everything from our individual health to the fabric of our democracy. And I'm going to uh, really hopefully talk for about 15 minutes um, sharing why I personally do this work, where, how CHT is, how the Center for Humane Technology is trying to create systemic change that will fundamentally restructure how technology is being built um, and the impact it has on our lives and the fabric of our democratic societies and share two resources that we've been putting together that we're very excited about that are going to be tools that help you all in doing your work around this issue. Um, so once I've kind of told a little of that story and presented the tools and I'm happy to open it up for questions and conversation. Um, and I'll tell you a little of how I got into this work and why I'm so excited to be speaking at Y for Y today. Um, I uh, I got started most of my career. I've been a software developer, but outside of that, I've always done work building uh, grassroots movements. Um, I got started when I was 18, when I was in college. Um, two things happened. The first is that, and this is dating myself, it was 2001 and 9-11 uh, had just happened. And very quickly, the U.S. was mobilizing for a war in Afghanistan without really, I think, a solid justification or plan, as we've seen. And a lot of us, um, me and my friends, were really concerned about this leap into war as a response at a time of grieving. And so um, we came together to meet about how we could stand up against this war and uh, wound up, I wound up putting together a website that because the moment was right, brought together 450 campuses around the country in the first real coordinated day of action against, um, against the war in Afghanistan. And I got to see how in the right moment, technology could galvanize people and bring us together. Um, and I also that year, started a website because um, I identify as asexual. And at that point, I'd never talked to another asexual person. And uh, so I created this website to just try to find people like me. And that website wound up being, um, which is called asexuality.org, wound up becoming the central gathering point for asexual people around the world and still is 20 years later. And um, I got to see firsthand how the internet, how technology could be this tool for us to come together and connect really deeply around the things that matter in our lives, to form relationships that made us feel less alone, that um, were transformative in our lives, and that built trust, that built trust um, around shared experiences across lines of difference in ways that built the power to change the world around us for the better. Um, and in both instances, the peace movement and in the asexual community, um, we were able to do that. We were able to do that because we uh, were understood how to, how to use technology in ways that um, respected the people who were using it and in ways that resulted in deep connection. And I really dedicated my life to building that kind of technology, building technology that let us come together um, to feel less alone and have the power to address some of the, the biggest challenges having to do with inequity, having to do with climate change uh, in the world. And what I found was just as I was uh, learning how to build that kind of technology, exploring it in my life, the rest of the industry was pointed in a really, really different direction. The rest of the industry was not really 
the, despite their rhetoric, not really that focused on uh, the depth of connection. They were focused on attention. They were focused on engagement. They were focused on getting as much of people's attention as they could and using whatever cognitive and psychological tricks they could to extract that attention, kind of like drilling into people's brains or like, like our, our, our minds were an intention piggy bank they want to kind of break into and get, get as much out of as possible. Um, and so they would say, we are you know, helping people make friends, but really what they meant is we're helping people find followers. They would say, we're helping people build community, but really what they meant was we're helping people build an audience for their broadcast. And um, in order to do that, I saw how at the same time as I was really thinking about how do we, how do we create these and, and seeing these um, really beautiful examples of uh, places where people were going deep uh, and Something that I learned in that process, um, by the way, which I'll, I'll come back to later, was that um, you can help people connect deeply, but you can't automate it at scale. You need a human doing the work of human connection for human connection to happen. You need someone holding the space, doing what Julie is doing, doing what I know many of you all do as activists, as organizers, as advocates of creating a space where people can come together to connect. Um, and software can help with that process, but you can't automate it. You've got to have humans doing that labor at human scale. And what I saw was this real desire to automate at a massive, massive global scale. When Facebook was hiring people, they when they tried to hire me, they were, I can't remember what the number was, but they were like some number of hundreds of thousands of users per engineer. Um, and, uh, and so what they focused on, because they couldn't deliver real connection, what they focused on was things that felt like connection, even though they weren't. Things that, little notifications that made you feel like people cared that you existed, when really all that happened is they broadcasted to you. Um, little ways that, uh, or they tagged a photo with you in it, or they'd done something else that, that gave you this little hit of feeling like someone mattered to you, even if you weren't being present with that person. Um, what they did was they, they took our need for connection, which is really deeply evolutionarily baked into us. For most of human history and most of pre-human history, we were in groups. And if you got kicked out of the group, um, you had a very, very short life expectancy. To be liked and respected by the people around us has been the same thing as survival, has been deeply caught up with survival for most of our evolutionary history. So when we feel alone, we feel incredibly, incredibly vulnerable. Um, and uh, when we feel connection, it's, it's like food. It's like some, it's, it's a thing that we know, our bodies know, our minds know, we deeply need to survive. And so social media companies were able to co-op that. They were able to sort of hack into our brains to turn that need for acceptance and community about, um, into a need for validation that was a number. They took that need for deep connection and they turned it into something like snap streaks, where you have a number that you might lose. Or they turned it into the engagement metrics of an influencer who is forced to kind of do per, perform in whatever way will build up their metrics, which both does really bad things for the attention economy. It, it promotes mis and disinformation because those things get a lot of engagement. Um, and it does horrible things for the mental health of influencers because the, the need for deep attention is being fulfilled it's kind of like you're, you're eating uh, an artificial nutrient that doesn't give your body what it needs. And I was watching this happen um, and became, uh, uh, and that's that, this concern, this journey that I was on brought me to the Center for Humane Technology, where we really focus on how the attention economy is incentivizing behavior that is deeply destructive, how it hacks into our brains and what happens when, um, how it hacks into our brains with persuasive technology and what negative downstream consequences happen when it does that. 
I'll give you one, just one tiny example. So if you are Facebook or Twitter or TikTok, what you really want to do is um, identify which content is highly engaging. You can do that with a retweet or a reshare button. So the stuff that people reshare a lot is probably going to be highly engaging. You can do that with a recommendation algorithm that looks at engagement across a wide range of content and then predicts which content is going to be most engaging to which people. Um, you can off, often they'll do it with a combination. They'll say, okay, what's the really viral content? What, people, what are people also engaging with? How do we use that to target people with the content that's most meaningful to them? And if you have seen the social dilemma, which was based largely on the Center for Humane Technologies work, um, you'll have a sense of how this operates. And something that uh, was touched on the social dilemma, but we're learning a lot more about um, with uh, um, with the uh, testimony of Francis Haugen, the uh, the Facebook whistleblower, is that there are two ways to make content that's really viral, two strategies for making stuff that's super engaging that a recommendation algorithm would love. The first is to create a sort of generic sense of awe and joy. Um, and uh, because not that many things are generically joyful to a lot of people, you get things like cat memes um, that are, you know, they're kind of harmless. <laughs> they're nice. They're, they're a good thing to have in your life, but they're not really making our lives or our um, democracy substantively better. And arguably, if we are consuming a lot of that kind of like high level stuff and not engaging deeply with the people around us, not engaging with the joy that we get from kind of looking at a tree outside of the window, then we're, we're losing something. But what's a lot more dangerous is the second really effective strategy for creating viral content, which is that people love to click a share button on something that create, triggers a sense of moral outrage. If it feels like the norms of your community being violated and you by saying, by pointing out the norms of your community being violated can stand up for what matters in your community. That feels really good to people. It taps into that, that deep instinct we have to be a good member of our community. And so people share that stuff a lot. And the stuff that they share most of all is something that triggers a sense of moral outrage about an outgroup, someone who's perceived to be outside of the community and a threat. And if you want to create content that triggers a sense of moral outrage about people outside of your community, often the easiest way to do it is disinformation, is to come up with lies that reinforce ideas that people already have about the other. So um, you, uh, if you are here in the US, if you are, um, if you want to target Democrats, you can come up with lies about Republicans. If you want to target, or you can skew the most outrage inducing version of a story about Republicans. If you are talking to Republicans, you skew a mo the most outrage inducing story you can about Democrats. And those are the things that are going to be loudest. Um, you make up stories about, uh, in other parts of the world, about religious groups that people consider other, about ethnic minorities that people consider other. Um, Often these stories are made up about uh, women who are taking power in ways that some people find threatening. Often they're made up about, very often about women of color, very often about trans people. And what happens is this sense of um, this human desire to amplify outrage winds up leading to widespread harassment. It winds up leading to real offline violence targeted individuals, um, even at entire communities. And this kind of outrage has been at the center of ethnic violence everywhere from Myanmar um, to India to Ethiopia. And so uh, this seemingly innocuous feature, a reshare button, an algorithm that looks at an engagement number has a really terrifying downstream consequence that is felt all over the world. And that is why we think that um, we need to not only change, not, not only share the, change the reshare buttons, which I'll um, in a second tell you about a very concrete <laughs> campaign we have to do exactly that, um, but change the underlying incentives of the attention economy. Change the definition of success 
through culture change, through regulation, so that um, creating hockey stick engagement is not the best strategy for, is not the way that you win as a tech company. Um, and because of that, in my work at the Center for Humane Technology, I'm really focused on two things. And I've got two resources I wanna share with you to help you, um, if, if that's work that you're interested in, that you're also working on, you wanna join us in where you're already doing it and you want resources to help you. The first is we need to build understanding broadly in the world among key decision makers about how the attention economy works, about how it exploits our psychology and about the profound negative consequences of that. Um, and one of the most powerful ways to do that we've found is youth organizing. Historically, most uh, movements that have led to widespread cultural change have had a very strong youth led component. You all are some of the best, when young people get up in front of top politicians like Senator Markey, who I know was speaking earlier today, um, and tell, powerfully tell your stories, people listen. And so your ability to tell these stories in public, to bring people together to tell these stories is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And I'll tell you some ways that we're supporting that as well. And the second thing, we really want to support you in doing is in building humane technology. As, as the culture shifts, as the regulation shift, as the definition of success that technology companies are aiming for shifts, we need people who are already pointed to that new definition of success who have the skill of building humane technology. And that's why we've started a course called Foundations of Humane Technology that's the center of a community of people who are doing that development work together. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is share quickly two resources that you can know about um, that you can use if you're also doing this work. Then I'm going to open up for questions and let people um, uh, use the action button to share their, to raise their hands. Um, though you're welcome to put questions in chat uh, if you are, um, if you are in the Zoom with us here. So the first resource I'm going to show you is, um, oh, Mohammed, I see you raising your hand. There's a, there's a reactions hand, raise hands thing you can do. Um, and uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to go ahead and share these resources and then I'm going to open up for questions more broadly, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so, the first thing I want to show you, I'm just bringing it up on my screen here, is our youth toolkit. Let me make it a little bigger. There you go. So, um, and I'm looking at a second monitor, so apologies. Um, so this is a very in-depth set of resources that we've built for anyone who is convening conversations with other young people about um, about technology. And it really follows the story that um, I, I, you know, I was only involved in it, that, that I had, that a lot of us had coming to the Center of Humane Technology. Um, uh, it's constructed a set of issue guides that take about 30 to 60 minutes to discuss. So the idea is that you can go into one of these issue guides, if you have a group that you're bringing together, or if you just really want to deep dive into this, read through it to get a really in-depth systemic understanding, and then take some of the questions um, and some of the ideas and discuss them with a group of your friends, of your classmates, wherever you think it's relevant to discuss the, these issues. And this is really built for both educators and youth organizers. Um, so the first is on the attention economy. It's looking at how the attention, how an economy structured to get as much attention as possible, as opposed to one structured for, around deep human connection, winds up incentivizing what is downstream a lot of harmful behavior. Um, and I'll, I won't click into all of these, but I'll show you just what this looks like here. Um, it's built around a series of questions. So it starts by looking at how social media companies make money, um, going into um, how competition really shapes the social media products we use 
in ways that eventually ca cause harm. And in each section, there's also a series of questions for you to think about and discuss as a group. So if the first one is a systemic understanding of the attention economy and how it incentivizes um, social media companies and really a wide range of technology companies to um, behave in a certain way. The second looks at persuasive technology, which is the output of what, what they're incentivized to do. And persuasive technology is technology designed to control human behavior. Um, it starts as simple things like, the way that a page is optimized to get us to be more likely to click on the button that the developer wants us to click, or the way the notification comes in to get us to stop paying attention to our life and start paying attention to our phone. But it gets into a range of things that are pretty pervasive and pretty invasive. When you look at the deep level of data collection that someone like TikTok can do on us to map our interests and map what we think about the world. Persuasive technology includes things that sort of try to nudge our opinions about things, that try to, um, uh, there's, there are entire campaigns to try to get us to want to make certain life choices. So for example, TikTok is very invested in getting people to want to become influencers so that they create content for their platform. Um, influencer uh, is currently the fourth highest career aspiration among um, social media influencer among elementary school students and the fastest growing category of business in the US, even though it is very financially unstable for most people and leads to pretty severe negative mental health outcomes. Um, so we're seeing the development of this sort of persuasive technology really as a mechanism of control, even authoritarian control of people, um, starting from just technology used to get people to, to um, to use apps. Um, and to understand persuasive technology, we really need to understand the underlying psychology that social media is tapping into. And that's where we talk about social media and the brain. To understand what, what are the cognitive mechanisms that they sometimes intentionally, sometimes accidentally are hitting again and again and again. And how can we, um, how can we create space for ourselves? So something like our need for human connection is focused on other people, not focused on facsimiles of connection that are created by technology. Um, and then finally, we look at the consequences of what happens when an attention economy that incentivizes persuasive technology hacks into our brains. And we look at the consequences from the standpoint of, as individuals, individual mental health, um, as communities, that are being divided and polarized, all the way to looking at the consequences as democracies, where um, uh, not only do polarization and outrage severely limit us, but um, they disproportionately target the um, voices who are most needed to, um, so for example, there's um, a good deal of research and people in a community who are looking at the ways that specifically women and especially trans women and especially women of color are um, targeted with online harassment to prevent them from running for office and disinformation. Um, so it's looking at the how the consequences ripple out to um, diminish our capacity as a society to live healthy lives and focus on what matters at a time when the crises of climate change and growing systemic inequity um, are making our need to come together more, more critical than ever. So this is really to help us understand the problem. And then there are three action guides to help us understand what we can do. Um, we can tell our stories. Uh, and as I said before, this is really the core of movement building. We have a website, which I'll also show you briefly, called, um, which I will show you actually here. We have a website called My Social Truth where you can read stories from others who have been impacted by social, um, by social media and who are taking steps to change it. And you can submit your own story and we will, after we review it, put it up on this site. Um, we also talk about the concrete steps you can use to take control of your use, especially to get them together with your friends to take control of your use because this is much more effective when you do it in groups. And finally, um, we invite you to imagine what humane technology might look like. 
And for those of you who are involved in the work of building technology, this is sort of a gateway into the other big piece, other big resource that I have um, to offer. And I'll talk about this one a little more briefly because I don't know how many technologists or technologists in training are watching this, but I want to make you aware just in case. And that is our new course, Foundations of Humane Technology. This is a much more in-depth dive. Um, it could be for anyone, but it's really built for people who are building products. And it, it looks at the product development process, kind of pulls apart all of the assumptions about how to build technology that leads to technology that are broken. Assumptions like, if you want your technology to be successful, you need to just grow as quickly as possible and not worry about the consequences because only the technology that grows um, that conquers the world first will matter. Um, it unpacks assumptions about intention and engagement and how you should um, engage them. It unpacks assumptions about who should be invited to the table, what stakeholder groups should get a voice in the process of building technology. It unpacks assumptions about machine learning algorithms, especially algorithmic bias, the way that systemic racism and sexism show up in the algorithms that we use, even when we don't intend them to. And uh, the, it, this consists of um, eight modules and has a very active community component. So if you join this course, not only are you gonna learn about how to build technology that respects human nature, how to build technology that narrows gaps of inequity and creates shared understanding rather than polarization, but you're going to be invited into a community of people from startups, from large platforms like Facebook, from universities, people all over the world who are working day in and day out to do the same thing. So um, these are the two resources that we have. The first is really if you're someone who just cares deeply about this or you're someone who's pulling conversations together because you're an activist, you're an organizer. The second is if you're someone who's building products yourselves. Um, and I will put links to both of these. The first is humanetech.com. Uh, I'll put, here we go. Uh, the first is humanetech.com slash youth. This, this is the toolkit. These are the discussion guides. And then the second is humanetech.com slash course. And if you're interested in the story banking, that is at So, oop, I messed up my URL here. There we go. Okay, so I've been presenting a lot at you. I'm now really eager to hear what questions, what ideas you all have, um, and happy to discuss these resources or anything else the Center for Main Technology is working on. Um, and so, Mohammed, I know you had your hand up. Uh, happy to let you go first. Starting at, so my first question to you is, is that we have started my work on Instagram for under, to stop the Instagram for underage children. Mm -hmm. And my other, and, and, but the other thing is Instagram just put a pause to it and they said they will uh, make a decision on Instagram for underage children next year. Then they might start offering Facebook for young kids and they might offer Twitter for young kids and then and then that that is going to lead to too much screen time on uh, on smartphone use and when will you come up with another new movie besides social dilemma so great great questions I'll I'll answer them separately the first is on the campaign to uh cancel to get rid of Instagram for kids, which we have signed on for where um, there's an organization called Fair Play. I don't know if they've spoken at this conference yet, but they're really leading that coalition effort. Um, and a lot of us are coming together because what Facebook is saying is they want to create a version for of Instagram um, that's safe for kids. And uh, what's actually happening is it's kind of like cigarette companies making candy cigarettes. Like they're just trying to get they're just trying, and but they're but they're like the candy cigarettes still have nicotine in them. <laughs> they still have toxins in them. Like this is uh, the um, Instagram for kids is a mechanism to teach young people um, how that 
how to receive their validation from social media and not from real human relationships that matter. And so it's absolutely something that we're blocking. I think in, in the wake of Francis Haugen's testimony, which was really damning about the impact of Instagram on young people, they, uh, they have put it on pause. And what I know from other campaigns and from talking to people inside of Facebook is that when the heat is on like this, they will do a bunch of things that look good and wait six months in the hopes that everyone forgets. So there's a real need, especially early next year, to keep the pressure on, to let them know that we haven't forgotten, we're watching them, and we're not going to let them do this. The reason they're doing it, um, the, uh, the other reason, the reason other than greed they're doing it, and, and then I'll, um, I, I'll pause and I'll get to your other question, is that they're terrified of TikTok. And um, they're terrified of the market share that TikTok is getting among young people. And TikTok is, I would say, in some ways, scarier to me than Instagram. So at the same time as we need to be blocking Instagram for kids, we also need to, um, I think in, in the tech reform space, sometimes we fall into a trap where we just focus on, uh, on accountability for Facebook. And don't get me wrong, Facebook needs to be held accountable. But I think, um, I think that we need to also look at YouTube. We also need to look at TikTok. Um, we also need to look at platforms like Snap that are creating a lot of harm in the world um, at holding accountable platforms like Twitch if we want to create a healthy ecosystem for young people. And there was a, there was a question about um, the next, uh, another movie that I can, I can answer, maybe not fully to your satisfaction, um, but I'll pause to see if you or other folks want, wanted to respond to that first answer. Okay, so um, there was a question about another movie. We work, I meet probably every other week with Exposure Labs, the folks behind The Social Dilemma. And what they've been doing, they're not look, working on another feature film, but they've been doing a lot of short form content to dive in more depth. And part of the problem is this is moving so quickly that it's really hard to make a movie about because by the time your movie is done, everything's shifted. So they are, um, putting out shorter form videos to provide a really in-depth understanding. Um, and I can uh, provide, drop a link or um, Julie, I don't know if you happen to have these links to drop in. Um, in-depth understanding around things like algorithmic bias, around harms to democracy, around harms to mental health. And they've got another series of videos that they're working on now. Um, so they're really looking to help educate people now, now that there is an active movement of people like you coming to um, coming together and talking about this. Uh, and then we're seeing, um, and we're also doing an extensive follow-up. People want to learn more. The best resource I can point you to if you really love The Social Dilemma is our podcast, Your Undivided Attention. And I'll put a link here um, at humanetech.com slash podcast. Uh, and this is where you can hear interviews with experts from around the world, including we're about to release an episode with uh, this interview with Francis Haugen, the, the Facebook whistleblower. Um, this is the best way to sort of get in depth into these issues if you want to learn more. So I'll, I'll pause for any other questions. Yes. And my other question I also have is, well, can we start a new petition campaign called Make Sure TikTok Stops Offering their social media accounts to underage children because TikTok already offers it and a lot of underage kids are forcing their parents who don't want to give their kids high-end smartphones, top-of-the-line smartphones like the iPhone 13 Pro or the iPhone 12 or the Galaxy Note. So I'm all for campaigns that target TikTok and ByteDance. Um, they, TikTok, when it was back when it was musically, had a history of ignoring COPPA, ignoring federal legislation introduced by Senator Markey, who I think was, was talking earlier today, um, ignoring federal legislation about technology built for people under the age of 13. And so um, I absolutely agree that they should be held accountable. Um, since you've mentioned petitions, I also wanted to, um, to raise your uh, Ray, let you all know about a petition that we just released that we would love you to review, um, which is at oneclicksafer.org. 
And this is in response to Francis Haugen's testimony, where we learned that, um, remember everything I was saying about virality and how virality promotes moral outrage? Well, it turns out that Facebook's internal research shows that it's way worse than even we thought. And that research also shows that they could make a really small change that would profoundly address misinformation and hatred on Facebook. Um, their estimates are it could be as effective as the rest of their moderation efforts combined. And that one change is that um, you, the share button would go away at a certain time. So if I share something and then my friends share it, after they've shared it, the share button disappears. It, get, it, it kind of gets two hops and then the share button disappears and people have to copy and paste it if they wanna keep sharing it. And what that does is it still allows things a little bit of virality, but the stuff that goes really crazy, the stuff like pandemic is, can only go out so far. And what yeah. they've found studying um, virality is that the more viral something is, the more times it gets shared, the worse it tends to be. So this would take um, a lot of the worst content off of Facebook. And we, we recommend that you um, check it out and sign the petition. Hey, I think Seth has a question next. So if we could yes, move on to Seth, it. that'd be great. Okay, I've unmuted. Okay, um, I'm curious. So when I think about this issue of kids having social media or designing social media for kids, it seems to me like the different companies are presenting it as if they can tweak some things and make it safer. Whereas I'm curious if you would agree, it seems to me that the things that are causing the problems are fundamentally just the entire thing. Like there's no tweaks you can do mm. to make Instagram not cause body image issues. Like how are you gonna prevent that from happening? For example, um, I'm curious what you think about that like possibility of tweaking things or whether it's impossible? Um, I'd say that when, when something we've said for a long time that we're hearing getting said a lot more um, in, in response to Francis Haugen's testimony, and I bring that up because it, it feels like th this is a moment that shifted everything, especially when she spoke to Congress. Um, the phrase that's gotten thrown around is that this is the big tobacco moment for tech companies. This is when we learn that not only is, is stuff bad, but they knew that stuff was bad well, at the same time as they were telling us on the outside they didn't. Um, and they're also, they have the best data to know what the impact is. Um, and so uh, we, we now know that they know that they know that stuff is bad, um, that what they're doing is causing harm. And uh, because what the harm is coming, not from like a particular set of feature of bugs, but from the core incentive, like they are incentivized to compete to get as much attention as possible. In that competition, there are certain winning moves and those winning moves are going to cause harm. And so you can't, you have to restructure how the, how the um, market works. You have to restructure what the incentives are. If you want to get to a, a, a place that isn't going to be harmful, for, harmful, for, harmful, for, harmful for children. Um, and so the metaphor I think of is uh, with, with big tobacco is the tech companies are saying, we wanna sell cigarettes to kids. We just wanna put better filters in them to take out some of the bad stuff. Um, and we're saying we need, we need a market where we're selling fewer cigarettes, period. And we're not selling them to kids at all. We need a fundamental restructure of the market in which you, large social media companies, are not going to be able to have a profitable business model and are not going to be able to have nearly as big a business because you having that business has a huge social cost. And um, there's, there, of course, they're going to resist that. But ultimately, we need, we as a movement need to be coming together to make that a possibility. And we need to be coming together to show that a different kind of technology is possible. Um, uh, and I see a message of oh, great. Um, I know that we're almost out of time. I think there might be time for one last question. Um, and uh, Julie or Lexi, uh, feel, feel free to let me know. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, we should have time for one more question. Yeah. And feel free to unmute yourself and ask if you have one. Otherwise, I'm happy to keep talking, but I, I know that, that we're almost ready for another keynote. Okay, yeah, um, Seth, go ahead. Um, I can jump in again. Uh, so when I think about the difference between big tobacco and uh, the current situation, I feel like one really important difference is that in the time of big tobacco and the revelations around the harms of cigarettes, there was that was it was totally unknown to the public that this was a thing and so, there was like scientists prescribing you know doctors prescribing cigarettes it was very they're like the facade was totally maintained and then there was this breaking point and then suddenly there was this like public galvanization and i'm curious if you see like what do you think about the current situation where we we've known that there's problems for so long it's we've known that facebook knows that there's problems for so long like just because it hasn't been so explicitly evidenced before i think it's still been kind of in public awareness to a degree. Do you think so that's going to change? I think it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's anyway. first of all, important to remember how quickly all this has happened, right? Like five, six years is not long in politics. And um, five, six years ago, most people weren't aware that this was a problem. They, they like maybe had some suspicions, but they didn't have anything like the understanding that many, many people do now. Um, also in the tobacco companies, like when their revolutions came out, many scientists and researchers were saying this is a really big problem, but the tobacco companies were denying it. And so it created this environment of uncertainty, which is exactly what the tech companies have been doing. Um, but there is one really critical difference, uh, which I think we think about a lot and it creates a, for us a great sense of urgency, which is that um, when someone smokes a cigarette, it doesn't reduce the ability of Congress to regulate cigarette companies. It doesn't create a political environment in which regulating cigarette companies is less likely because getting anything done is less likely. But social media companies do. Social media companies undermine, by amplifying outrage, undermine the capacity of our democratic institutions to do what really matters. And so there's almost this race between like, can, can we regulate? Can we shift this market before it undermines our ability to um to hold it accountable and i think that's that's something that that we're grappling with that drives a lot of our work um and i with that i think we're about at time sorry to end on a on a sour note so maybe what i'll end is say like that's also why talking to folks like you talking to folks who are doing the work of building this movement, of building technology, gives me a huge amount of hope. And I hope that the resources that we've put together today can be of uh, benefit to you all. And uh, Lexi and Julie, Julie, let me know if we're um, if we need to wrap. Uh, I'm happy to keep going otherwise. Uh, yeah, I think we should wrap in the next couple of minutes. Okay. Um, is there should is is there the time for another question then? Um, yeah, if it's not too long of one, we can probably get to one. Okay, let's let's see if we can fit more one one more in. Uh, Mohammed asked, "How dangerous are cigarettes for kids?" Um, uh, all cigarettes are horrible, um, and they're especially horrible, and I think this is also an analysis of social media. The toxins in cigarettes are especially um, harmful to bodies that are in development, um, to bodies that are using hormones to signal how they're going to grow, um, and that are sort of laying the groundwork. Um, and the same thing is true of people's brains. Young people's brains are still laying down the found fundamental foundational wiring that they're going to have for the rest of their life. It's kind of like you're, there, there's a foundation of a house being built. And so if you mess up that early wiring, it has much worse downstream effects than the same thing happening, the same toxins in an adult body or the same toxin, the th same negative things happening to an adult brain. Um, it's still bad. It's still bad for adults, but it's much, much, much worse for young people. This is a lot of why we ban alcohol for people under the age of 21, because we recognize that young people's brains, while 
um, incredibly capable um, for those of you, especially who are under the age of 18 or under the age of 21. I don't, I don't want to, to feed into the myth that young people are not capable of changing the world because you absolutely, absolutely are. Um, and uh, young people's brains are also more vulnerable. And so these questions are really, really critical uh, as we think about the capacity, the cognitive capacity, the, the mental health of an entire generation. And I think with that, it's almost time to switch to the next session if there aren't any other questions. Thank you all so much for coming um, and listening today. I hope that you take the time to look at these resources and I'm going to post them one last time um, and maybe even glance at them quickly before the next session. The first is our youth toolkit. This is the series of discussion guides. And the second, um, and if you look at them, please feel free to give us feedback because we're in the process of refining these, see if we can turn them into videos, see if we can evolve them. And the second is this course. Which is for people who are actively building technology. Um, and I also just wanna give a huge thanks to um, Julie, uh, and to everyone at Lookup for the incredible work you put into making this summit happen. Great, thank you so much, David.